If you've spent basically any time on the internet, you're probably well aware of how frustrating it can be to have ads just smothering the web page you're trying to browse. And if you're anything like me and have a lot of different servers and other devices on your local network, it can get a little bit tedious to remember all of the different IP addresses. Well, today we're going to solve both of these issues using something called Pi-hole, and we're gonna run it on something you might not suspect. So stick around. If you're watching this video, there's a really good chance that you're already familiar with Pi-hole. If not though, it's a utility that basically sits between you and the DNS server you wanna use, meaning whenever you type in something like google.com, it'll ask a real DNS server like 1.1.1.1 where google.com actually is, returning an IP address. But when your web browser tries to resolve an address for a known ad service, Pi-hole will block that DNS query. Pi-hole can do a lot of other cool things too, like cache DNS queries to speed up browsing, function as a DHCP server, operate as a local DNS server so you can access your own servers from something like myserver.local, and much more. We won't do all of that in this video, but we will set up ad blocking as well as local DNS records. As the name might imply, it's pretty common to install Pi-hole onto a Raspberry Pi, but since those are a little hard to come by currently, I'm actually going to try installing this on a 15-year-old Mac Mini that I picked up a little while back for $15. This might seem a little strange, and many people watching this video understandably don't like Macs, but this might be a useful way to give the silicon a little bit more life. Also, I feel like I should make some sort of apple pie hole joke here, but I think I'll refrain from that. I had planned to also install Home Assistant alongside Pi Hole but that was going to be a bit tricky being limited to 32-bit operating systems, at least until I can upgrade this to a Core 2 Duo. The Core Duo inside this Mac Mini is far from powerful and definitely isn't efficient by today's standards, but it wasn't as bad as I originally thought it might be pulling just over 20 watts at idle. 20 watts isn't great, but with how much Raspberry Pis are selling for, it might still be worth considering, at least if you had one of these on hand already. We'll look at comparisons a little later on in the video after we get everything set up and running. Before we get started, I want to take just a few seconds to talk about the sponsor of this video. Atlas VPN has one of the best deals on the market, and right now if you click the link in the description below, you can get 3 years plus 3 months for free for only $1.83 a month. Having a VPN service is incredibly helpful because it can allow you to access content outside your region, and it encrypts your data between you and the Atlas VPN servers largely protecting you from things like man-in-the-middle attacks. I started using Atlas VPN a few months ago, and I've really enjoyed how simple and fast the service is. I also appreciate some of the cool features, like streaming-optimized servers, and the ability to switch between WireGuard and IPsec protocols. Once again, you can get Atlas VPN for three years, plus three months for free, for only $1.83 a month, so head down to the link in the description now so you don't miss out on these savings. This Mac Mini has a Core Duo clocked at 1.83 GHz, as well as 2 GB of DDR2 memory, which isn't great, but it should be just fine to run a headless install of Debian and Pi-hole. This Mini originally came with a mechanical hard drive, but I swapped that out for a 128 GB SSD in my last video, where I set this machine up as a retro game emulator. We could use the mechanical hard drive, but I wanted to save that to preserve the original operating system. In that video, we also set up something called ReFind. Now, normally, because of the EFI limitations of this old Mac, we wouldn't be able to boot into Linux installs, but ReFind fixes that. I'm not going to go into detail here, so if you're curious about how that all works, go check out my last video. For our operating system, I just downloaded Debian 11 32-bit and then used Belena Etcher to flash it to a USB drive. From there, we could just plug it in and boot from it using the ReFind boot manager. I went through all the basic steps of installing Debian, deselected any desktop environment, and made sure to select the SSH server so we could easily remote into it using an SSH client. Once finished, I restarted the system and removed the install drive. After Debian booted up, I ran su- to operate as root, and then ran apt update and upgrade to make sure everything was up to date. After mistyping it once, I ran this command to install the sudo and nettools utilities. 
With NetTools installed, I could run ifconfig to see what the local IPv4 address was for the Mac Mini. Now you could do this a few different ways, but I like to have NetTools installed anyway. With that all out of the way, I was able to ditch the monitor, mouse, and keyboard and connect to the server using SSH. From there, I ran su dash again, and then ran a user mod command to add the Haven user to the sudo group, allowing that user to run commands as super user. After logging out and back in, I ran sudo who am I just to confirm that we were operating as root. If you're wanting a simple install of PyHole, you can easily just head over to the PyHole website and copy this curl command, which is what I did. But before that, I also needed to make sure that I installed curl using apt install curl. Then it's basically as simple as copy paste enter. After a few minutes, we should get this screen that just lets us know that PyHole is going to be a network wide app blocker. And it also lets you know how you can support the PyHole project. Then as this next message suggests, that's really hard to say, PyHole needs to have a static IP or a DHCP reservation so that the IP doesn't change. For this video, I just logged into my router and set up a reservation. You can either look up how to do that on your specific router or Google how to set up a static IP in Debian, both of which are fairly simple to do. Next, I selected Cloudflare as my upstream DNS and then hit yes to include the recommended ad block list and also hit yes to install the admin web server. I also opted to use query logging and chose to log everything primarily for the sake of this video. After a few more minutes, there was a message displayed with the address of the web UI and password. Rather than using this password, I just created my own by hopping back into the command line and running sudo pyhole-a-p and then typing in my new password. With that done, I navigated to the URL shown earlier and landed on the pyhole admin panel. Here, you can browse a lot of these different settings and features and also see that the default ad list is enabled. To test it out, I set up my network interface in Windows to use our new pyhole server as its DNS but didn't confirm the setting just yet. To see PyHole in action, I navigated to an article on WCCF Tech's website, and as you can see, there are plenty of ads on this page. Then we can apply our settings to use PyHole instead, and after a hard refresh of the page, we see a lot of those ads disappear. If you head over to the query log, you can see all of the DNS queries that PyHole blocked. It's not perfect, but it's still pretty cool. Right now, this only works on my Windows machine, so to make this work network-wide, I can log into my router settings, and under DHCP, I can change the DNS address to our PyHole IP address. Now, it's probably smart to use another upstream DNS as the backup, just in case the PyHole server crashes. But now you can see that I have other local IPs in the query log, meaning other devices on my network, at least within the DHCP scope, should now be using PyHole. If your router doesn't allow you to change the DNS server, you could try disabling DHCP on your router and instead set up DHCP using PyHole. I'm not gonna cover that here, but you should be able to find plenty of good videos talking about it. Another cool thing PyHole can do is provide local DNS records. So instead of having to remember that my Ubuntu server is located at 192.168.1.93, I can set up a DNS record for that IP address with the domain ubuntu-server.local, which is quite a bit easier to remember. Now I already know what a lot of you are thinking, which is something along the lines of, why don't you just use a Raspberry Pi? Which is a fair point. A Raspberry Pi would be smaller, more efficient, and much less of a hassle to set up. But right now, at least when this video goes live, even something like a used Pi 3 Model B with a power supply and small SD card could easily cost you over $50, with Raspberry Pi 4s costing a lot more. Obviously the cost of power consumption is important to consider as well. And I want to be clear, I'm not recommending anyone go out and buy something like this old Mac Mini. But if you already have one lying around or something similar, it actually might be worth it. I made this little calculator in Google Sheets to play around with some numbers. So here we can see a few things. First, I have the initial cost of my Mac Mini, as well as an estimate of a Raspberry Pi 3B used with a power supply and 8GB SD card. We can also see what the watt hours is, so the Mac Mini pulls around 21 watts, and the Pi 3 is an estimated about 2 watts. Now over here, we can type in a kilowatt hour price, so I could go up to something like 30 cents per kilowatt hour, 
but I'm going to go down to 15 cents, which is sort of around an average of the US. There's a lot of states that are pretty cheap and then some states that average a lot higher. But if we were to go to something like, you know, 15 cents a kilowatt hour, which isn't that far off from where it's at where I live, and we go for one year, we see that it's actually cheaper to use the Mac Mini versus the Raspberry Pi 3B. Now, if we go up to two years, for example, at this price, the Raspberry Pi starts to become a bit more cost effective. However, if I already owned this Mac Mini and I didn't spend any money on it, it starts to get a little bit closer in price. But this could obviously vary, you know, if electricity costs a lot more, like 30 cents a kilowatt hour. You can see that over the course of two years, you're paying almost double by using this Mac Mini, even though it was free. So power consumption is something to take into account here, and that's very understandable. But I also think it's possible that someone who already has this Mac Mini, even if you're paying this, you know, 30 cents, if you only have it for a year, you're paying about what you'd pay to use that Raspberry Pi. And I have a feeling a lot of people after a year of using something like this might decide to start tinkering even more. And rather than running this on the Mac Mini, they might upgrade to some other kind of home server and run this in a Docker container or something. So it's it, it depends on what the energy cost is where you're at and also how how good of a price you can get on something like a Raspberry Pi 3B. So hopefully this was a somewhat realistic look at costs and energy and all of that stuff. All right, back to the script. Hopefully this was a fun look at some of the things you can do with Pi-hole, as well as how you could potentially repurpose an old PC like this Mac Mini. If you'd like to see more videos like this, maybe check out the video where I repurposed the same Mac Mini as a retro gaming emulator, or where I converted an old gaming PC into a home server using Unraid. Also, don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and as always, Thanks for watching, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one. Then, as this mess ne then as this next message so oh my gosh. Then as this next message message suggests. Ow, ow, ow.